Running fast with a low heart rate sounds way too good to be true, right? Especially if right now, simply looking at your running shoes spikes your heart rate. But by the end of this video, you're gonna see how it's not only possible, but really holds the key to you running faster, for longer, pain-free. Imagine this, you've been running regular 5Ks and 10Ks, maybe your first half marathon, and you found it harder than expected, particularly the second half of the race, where your pace slowed, your legs felt really heavy, and you realized that your base endurance isn't quite where it needs to be to maintain your target pace. Following that experience, after a bit of research, you discover low heart rate training and running slow to run faster, but it feels really unnatural. Just running at a snail's pace has your heart rate way up above your target zone. It feels slow, ploddy, and wooden. A whole load of effort spent going nowhere fast. In fact, a lot of the time, the only way you can get your heart rate back under control is to stop and walk for a while. It's super frustrating. I know, it's what I just described, that was me. But with some patience and a lot of perseverance, low heart rate training really works. In fact, it's how I took half an hour off my marathon finish time in six months. The thing is, there are 10 fairly counterintuitive things I learned in that process, and once you know what they are, you'll be able to start training more efficiently and effectively to run faster at a low heart rate. So the first thing that made a massive difference for me was understanding that my heart and your heart, they don't know the difference between running, walking, cycling, any other form of exercise. It's all about intensity from a point of view of your physiology. Okay, so whatever it is pace-wise that gets your heart rate up into zone two, but no higher, is where you need to be. Okay, so that could be a steady state, easy paced run. Or if you're just, if you're just starting out with this, that could be a power walk. You know, you're, you're just getting out there and you're getting moving and even just walking briskly gets you up into the right zone. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. You'll find with a bit of consistency though, you're actually able, especially if you start with a run walk process, a run walk program, you're able to quite quickly transition from needing to walk to stay in zone two to be able to run slowly in zone two. I mean, this is, this is the goal of the whole thing, to be able to run faster whilst maintaining the same low heart rate. That's what happens as we get trained in this, as, as we get better and we improve our aerobic capacity, we improve our endurance. Now, it's not just about when you're starting out, it's also about as you're running, as you're getting into the program and you start running different terrains, you start finding that you're addressing more hills, you might need to walk the hills to keep your heart rate where it needs to be. Again, we're gonna talk later on about pace, but just when we're looking at staying in zone two and not spiking your heart rate, that's where we need to be really, really disciplined. And that's what a lot of people, it's where a lot of people really struggle. Okay, the discipline and the patience and the ego, quite frankly. You know, if you're used to pushing yourself hard with every run, overtaking people, running people down, feeling like you're really, you're doing a really great job, all of a sudden being the person who is holding back, who's letting all the runners come past you on a Sunday morning, that takes some pride to be swallowed. And there's, you know, that, that's a challenge for a lot of us, but there's, there's nothing wrong with doing that because you're doing this with purpose. So if, Normally, you'd run up that long hill, but you'd be a bit gassed at the top. Just walk it. Walk it knowing that your heart rate, and you can watch your heart rate, is still staying in the zone you wanted to work at. And as I said right at the top of this point, your heart does not know the difference. You're still working at that appropriate effort level to be getting those true aerobic training benefits. What if your heart rate does spike? What if you do suddenly look at your watch and find that you've been running too hard and you, you, you've jumped well out of that zone two bracket? And again, in terms of zone two, obviously you need to actually have set your heart rate zones. And there's a video which I'll link down in the description, which will walk you through the process of figuring out what your max heart rate is. And a bit of a spoiler, it's got nothing to do with your age. Again, a lot of people are using these age-based heart rate um, heart rate calculations and they're just 
Anyway, zone two, if you jump out of that and you spike your heart rate because you've suddenly been running too fast, or like I said, you ran up that hill, you probably should have walked up at this point, all is not lost. Your run is not ruined. And the misconception is that, oh, I've blown it. I've all of a sudden, I've gone too hard. My heart rate's up here. It's going to take forever to come back down. Again, it's an exercise in discipline. In fact, as runners, as we're working on our endurance, we're working on building that aerobic capacity, one of the big skills is learning to manage your heart rate and allow it to drop back down whilst still moving. I'll say still moving rather than still running because chances are you're going to want to actually back off to a walk, let everything calm down, and then gently build back into the run. But ultimately, as you then progress and become fitter, become more capable in this kind of aerobic realm, you'll find that you're able just to ease back on the pace of the run, ease back on the effort of the run, and see your heart rate drop back down to where it needs to be. If you started there and you spiked up here, you might find yourself here, you see not necessarily exactly where you previously were, but you're not just simply seeing that very, uh, well, initial quick spike just turn into a, a much higher plateau of harder work and higher heart rate for the rest of the run. It's easy to do in terms of allowing yourself just to keep pushing once you're up there, but that's not the goal. Allowing yourself to drop back down and get used to trying to work on managing your heart rate is such an important skill. And you'll notice that I've been talking about watching your heart rate on your watch, not watching your pace on your watch. Now, there's a number of reasons I say it like that. None less, none less, none more, I suppose, than because pace is dictated by all sorts of different things. Of course, terrain, but also heat. Okay, so the, the just the ambient temperature and the ambient kind of humidity and those sorts of things, they all will impact the ability for you to run at a certain pace for a certain heart rate. So for me, what I do is I hide pace on my watch. I take it off the activity screen on my watch. I can go and review it when I download my data later on. That's fine. It's in the, the Chorus app. But when I'm looking on my watch mid-run, I just see my heart rate data and my time. And that's all I'm really interested in because that allows me just to simply focus on the one thing that matters, which is the intensity I am running at. If all of a sudden I'm looking at pace, I know what I'm like. I know that the ego will creep in. And with the ego creeping in, yes, I know that the goal is, is heart rate, but I also want to run, uh, you know, mentally I'm thinking I want to run at sub this pace and blah, blah, blah. It's hard to manage those two things. Take one off your plate, just focus on what matters. Now, a common frustration I often hear about low heart rate training is that it's dull, it's boring, it's doing lots of long, slow running. And to be fair, it is a lot of long, slow running, but that's not to say it needs to be boring. Okay, I mentioned earlier about not wanting to, to spike your heart rate, and that's, that's really true. But, of course, you can still work on going through the gears. In fact, I think there's a massive, massive, massively important role in going through the gears. And by going through the gears, I mean just starting to work on some neuromuscular training. You may have heard me talk about this before on the channel, but we get so hung up on thinking about the heart and lungs. Okay, so the, the aerobic system. But actually, that's just one piece of the puzzle. What about the link between your brain and the muscles. What about working those muscles through the kinds of range of motion that you need to be working through to allow your legs to kind of remember how to run faster when you put the, put the pedal down, when you actually ask them to run faster. You've got to practice that if you expect it to be there when you want to push. I've met lots of runners in the past who have done lots of low heart rate training. They've focused on lots of long, slow, easy running. And don't get me wrong, they got quicker over those, uh, those sorts of distances, those longer distances, simply because their aerobic system is that much better. But they've lost top end pace because it's been goodness only knows since they really opened up and started turning their legs over quicker. So what you can do is 
a couple of things. You can be a bit playful with this. Within a long, slow run, and this isn't something you do lots of, so let's say you're doing a 12-mile run. Within that, four or five times spread out, you can just do a few kind of 15, 20-second little surges. Just go up, take yourself up to 5K race pace and beyond. It's only short. Okay, if we're suddenly turning that into 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, you're just going to blow a gasket and find yourself constantly working on what I said earlier in terms of trying to bring your heart rate down. But if it's just a very short burst, then you're just going to be working on turning the legs over that little bit quicker, reminding your body how that feels, and it should feel good, it should feel really good, it should feel light, it should feel springy, it should feel athletic, but not in such a way that's going to really start to mess with the, the aerobic side of the run that you're doing. The other side as well is at the end of the run, and I, I love this, at the end of long slow runs, finishing off, not at my door, but finishing off mile, half mile from home, and just doing a few sets of strides, short acceleration runs, you know, 50, 80 yards, something like that, where you're just, again, going through the gears up to kind of mile rep type pace, again, whatever you want to think of it as, perhaps far, faster, let's at least say faster than 5K race pace, Again, it doesn't need to be super prescriptive, but basically we're saying go through the gears, a little bit of faster running, really focusing on form, almost exaggerated form. There's a couple of things that go on there. Firstly, it's allowing you to remember how to run well or to teach your body how to run well, technically well, run with good form under fatigue. And secondly, it's just reinforcing those neuromuscular links between your brain, and the muscles, again, under fatigue. Okay, so don't do lots of these because you are fatigued, so volume won't do you any favors at all. We're looking at maybe doing four to six reps with a long walking break in between. Should be fully recovered. This, think of this as, weirdly, a kind of a part of your cool down. You should be fully recovered in between these reps. It's not, a, it's not a, an interval, you know, a short, super short interval session. It's not that at all. Recover go again. It should feel light, it should feel sprightly, and you should finish a long run feeling a lot more of a buzz than you would do normally. A lot of the time you finish a long run, you get home, it's like, oh, okay, that was, that was hard, that feels, that feels good, that feels kind of virtuous to have done that, but I feel like I've done a long run. Whereas these, you kind of come home, of course you've done the long run, but you come home and it just feels like there's a bit more zip in the legs, feels a little more I like to think of it as kind of a bit more buzz. I don't know. I hope that, that comes across right. And the very last point I wanted to make with this is to really, really listen to your body. Okay, again, some people get so hooked up on the numbers that they just push through regardless. Okay, they, they feel these kind of aches and pains and they think, well, you know what, it probably won't get any worse. Spoiler, it usually does. Um, and they just say, right, I must hit these certain benchmarks in terms of my weekly, again, time spent in zone or weekly mileage or whatever, however they're measuring it, you can't just get so obsessed on the numbers. You've got to listen to your body and allow yourself the time away from running if your body needs it to get the recovery right. Because as I said in the video the other day, it's better to take a week off proactively to allow yourself to recover from a, a small ache or pain than it is to be forced to miss a month, six weeks. That's where your fitness is really gonna take a nosedive. Now, taking that right back to the start of this, your body does not know the difference between running and another form of exercise. So, you can get away with getting on the bike. If, you, if your shins are hurting, because you ramped on the volume too quickly, get on the bike. There's a certain fitness, aerobic fitness, endurance, which transfers really well from cycling to running, it doesn't really go the other way. So in the world of triathlon, you see an Ironman triathlon in particular, you see people who are really quite injury prone when it comes to running. They do a lot of their training on the bike. They don't do a great deal of run training. They do, but they don't do the same as you would do if you're an out and out runner. And they absolutely smash it when it comes to running a marathon off the bike in an Ironman because they built the fitness on the bike. Now, I know for a fact that you could be a great runner, stick that great runner on the bike, and they will be 
garbage. The strength isn't there. The, it just it just isn't the same. But going that way, it works. So have some confidence in the fact that if needs be, you can just jump on the bike, be it static bike or getting out and cycling, and you can keep working on this whole system without actually putting your body through the pounding that is running. Earlier, I mentioned that time I took 30 minutes off my marathon time in just six months using low heart rate training. I'll link to that video on screen now. Knowing that you made it to the end of this video, I'm certain that you'll enjoy that one. I'll see you over there.